Good day. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Ann Aiken. I'm the acting designated federal officer for NVAC. Welcome to the February 2022 National Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting. This is a special meeting as we'll be celebrating 35 years since the inception of NVAC. Um, uh, I wanted to take just a moment to uh, thank our chair, Dr. Robert Hopkins, for his leadership and work on NVAC. Not only is he chairing this meeting, but he's also presenting not once, but twice. He really is instrumental in guiding NVAC over the past several years, and I'm very grateful for his service and dedication to the field. Um, with that, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the staff in the Office of, the Infectious, of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, um, as well as our contractors who play pivotal roles in the management of the committee, and this includes Emily Downs, Viola Jacobs, and Rebecca Lazaration. Um, and there are just a few things you should know before we get started today. First, this is a public meeting. It's being reporter, recorded. All statements made today are on the record. Second, um, this is, advisory committee is governed by federal, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA for short. FACA provides rules about the circumstances by which agencies or officers um, of the federal government can establish or control committees and groups like this one um, and obtain advice or recommendations. The voting members are special government employees and are therefore subject to conflict of interest laws and regulations, as are all members of the, um, who work for the federal government. Uh, these members previously provided information about their personal, professional, and financial interests. Each voting member's financial interests and outside affiliation has been carefully screened to, um, each year to ensure that they comply with federal ethics law. Uh, the liaison representatives are non-voting members of the advisory committee and are not subject to the same FACA rules as the voting members. Additionally, um, the information provided at this meeting does not necessarily represent uh, the official position of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee um, or the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, any mention of products, processes, services, manufacturers, companies, or trademarks does not constitute an endorsement um, by HHS, um, NVAC, or the U.S. government. So with that, I'd like to proceed with roll call for today's meeting. I'm going to take the official attendance and call off each of the names of the NVAC members. Please verbally respond when I call your name. Robert Hopkins. I'm present. Hello. Melody Ann Butler. I am present. Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Good afternoon. Tim Cook. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hi. John Dunn. I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Jeff Dushin. Good morning, present. Good morning to you. Uh, Chris Arisman. I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Len Friedland. I am present and hello, everybody. Hello. Dave Fleming. Hi, and I'm here. Hello. Uh, Dan Hoft. Present. Um, hi, all. Hello. Molly Howell. I'm here. Hi, Molly. Jewel Mullen. I know you're here. I saw you. But we cannot hear you. So maybe we can check to make sure her, um, her audio is working. Sabra. Um, and we'll come back to Dr. Mullen. Uh, Stephen Renderknecht? Yes, I am present. Thanks. Hello. Robert Schechter? Present. Thank you. Hi. Winona Stolzfus? Good morning. I'm present. Good morning to you. Gita Swami? And Robert Swanson? Hi, I'm here. Hello. And next up, um, Chris Regal. Hello, thank you. Hi, Chris. Claire Hannon. Rebecca Coyle. Good afternoon, I'm present. Good afternoon. Kelly Good. Hi, I'm here, thank you. And Martin. Hello, I'm present. Hello, uh, John Douglas. 
or any, anyone from NACHO on? Okay, uh, Carrie Robinson. Good afternoon, I'm here. Hi, Carrie. Hello. Uh, Hanna El Sali. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Linda Lambert. Yes, hi, Anne and everyone, I'm here. Hello, Melinda Wharton. And Melinda, I did see, so Dr. Wharton. Okay, uh, Mary Beth Hans. Good afternoon, I'm present. Good afternoon, David Hushner. Hello, yes, I'm present. I, I think I didn't get your last name correct, I apologize. Uh, Mary Rubin. Good afternoon, I'm here. And good afternoon, Uzo Chikwama. Good afternoon, everyone present. Good afternoon, Barbara Mullock. Okay, Troy Knighton. I'm here, hi Ann. Hi Troy. And Jewel Mullen, I think your mic is working. Wanna give it a go? It, it is, and I can see you, hi. <laughs> Hello. All right, so that's the roll call. Um, Next up, I'd like to, I have the pleasure of introducing Admiral Rachel Levy. She is the Assistant Secretary for Health, and she will provide us with opening remarks today. She will also swear in four new members. Admiral Levine is the Director of the National Vaccine Program and provides advice and counsel to the Secretary on public health issues um, and science, including immunization. Um, Admiral Levine is a pediatrician who serves as a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Admiral Levine, please share your opening remarks with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction. And I am so pleased to join you again to provide opening remarks. So I would truly like to welcome you, our NVAC members, speakers, and others watching this meeting online. And we have four new NVAC members for me to swear in in just a few minutes. In my role as the Assistant Secretary for Health, I really work every day to help people. And building a stronger foundation for immunizations is just such an important priority for me and our office. And leading the National Vaccine Program in this committee is truly an honor. Now, NVAC is turning 35. The National Vaccine Advisory Committee, or NVAC as we call it for short, was established in 1987. The committee recommends ways to achieve optimal prevention of human infectious diseases through vaccine development and provides direction to prevent adverse reactions to vaccines. In the first 35 years, NVAC developed recommendations and reports on a variety of very important topics, including supporting global immunizations, improving data exchange, and overcoming barriers to low vaccine uptake. Likewise, the NVAC standards for both pediatric and adult immunization practice provides optimal standards for practices for all healthcare providers and immunization programs. In addition, NVAC has convened multiple subcommittees in the last several years to address topical issues in a very timely manner. Those include vaccine confidence, immunization equity, and the COVID-19 vaccination. These topics span the entire immunization system and help provide the government with sound, science-based advice and recommendations to optimize immunizations in our country. I know that many of you have been working hard on COVID-19. I want to personally thank you for your efforts Public health providers and medical providers continue to respond to the COVID-19 crisis by saving lives and protecting people from a now a preventable illness and lowering our risk for spreading the virus, SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19. As all of, you, all of you know, our COVID-19 vaccines have a remarkable safety profile and they are highly effective. And we are still working to help people to complete the series of vaccines and to get boosted when eligible, to protect themselves as well as those around them, their families, and in particular, their children and friends that have, might have compromised immune systems. 
I am very focused on building momentum to get more shots in arms. As you know, it's not the vaccines that help us make the progress, it is vaccinations. But I do want to take a moment to recognize the remarkable data on the COVID-19 vaccine program. More than 535 million vaccine doses have been administered. And more than 212 million people are fully vaccinated in the United States. That equates to more than 64% of the U.S. population. Now, these numbers are very encouraging, but much work remains to be done because, unfortunately, millions of Americans are still not protected from this devastating and yet preventable disease. Now, as we move forward, it is very important that we keep health equity at the center of all of our plans and all of our efforts. As you know, health equity equity has been a longstanding focus of my career. I was honored to be a member of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, which was created last year to provide specific recommendations to President Biden to mitigate health inequities caused by or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and for preventing such inequities in the future. The task force published its final recommendations report in October 2021, and it is publicly available on the HHS website. We have been working across the nation to ensure that there are tens of thousands of vaccination sites across the United States. And we're also asking schools to work with their local and state health departments to host pop-up school vaccination clinics as another way to vaccinate eligible students. We're also working with respected community members and leaders, such as yourselves, who can speak to their communities about the safety, about the effectiveness of these vaccines, and about their importance, so that people can make the decisions about vaccinations that are correct and right, not only for themselves, but for their families and their communities and for our nation. And so I want to take a moment to thank the thousands of individuals and groups that have joined our COVID-19 community core, and have encouraged family members, friends, and those living in their community to get vaccinated. If you have not already joined, you can still sign up by visiting www.wecandothis.hhs.gov slash COVID Community Core. Wecandothis.hhs.gov slash COVID Community Core. So before I end my remarks, I want to mention vaccine confidence and NVAC's work in this area because it is essential that we overcome vaccine hesitancy and increase acceptance of immunizations across the lifespan. And so now I'm talking, of course, about the COVID-19 vaccine, but I'm actually talking about all immunizations, our infant and childhood immunizations, our immunizations for adolescents and young adults and our immunizations for middle-aged adults and for seniors, immunizations across the lifespan. I would like to truly thank the entire Vaccine Confidence Subcommittee for their work on this very important and very timely topic. I thank them for their work in developing a report to synthesize and summarize evidence and research addressing vaccine confidence and for recommending new and implementable strategies and approaches to sustaining and increasing confidence in vaccines across the lifespan. I look forward to your recommendations. And so now I would like our four new members, please, to go on camera. I'm going to introduce you, and then I will swear you in as a group. And you do need to raise your right hand when this happens. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Duchin. Uh, is the Health Officer and Chief of the Communicable Disease Epidemiology and Immunization Section for Public Health in Seattle and King County. He is also a professor at the University of Washington, Seattle. Dr. Jewel Mullen is an Associate Dean for Health Equity and a professor at the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School. Dr. Stephen Rinderdecht, is a pediatrician at Unity Point Clinic in Waukee, Iowa, and was named a 2012 Childhood Immunization Champion by the CDC's National Center 
for immunization and respiratory diseases. And Dr. Winona Stolfus has recently retired and previously served as the acting regional health officer in the Southeast region and a school health officer providing medical direction in eight counties in New Mexico. She was also the Health Systems Bureau Medical Director at the New Mexico Department of Health and an Executive Director at the Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless and Regional Health Officer for the State of Mexico. State of New Mexico, I believe. So, Drs. Juchin, Mullen, Rinder, Rinderneck, and Stofus. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your names correctly. Please raise your right hands and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly solemn swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will, I will support and defend, and defend the Constitution, the Constitution of, the United United States. of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all, all enemies, enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office on which I am about to enter. Of the office of which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. You are now officially members of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Well, thank, thank you. you all for your time today. I appreciate your dedication and commitment to NVAC and to optimizing all of our work. I look forward to working with you. And I want you to know that your ex expertise is really, truly invaluable to me and the work of our department to improve the health of all Americans. So now I will turn to Dr. Hopkins to provide the chair's welcome. Thank you, Admiral Levine. We appreciate you uh, joining us this morning and swearing in our new members uh, of the committee. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our virtual NVAC meeting. We've had a very busy and productive last few months. Thank you, Ann, for getting us started. I also want to thank you and the NVAC team for its work in planning this meeting and supporting the committee throughout the year. And thank you, Dr. Levine, for your thoughtful remarks. I also want to thank the NVAC members and subcommittee members for their work to further the work of this committee. I want to wish a warm welcome to our new members. I remember being sworn in to NVAC. It's rewarding to join this group and to help further our immunization system. So please let me add my congratulations. I wanted to take a moment to give you the, to give the committee and our viewers a bit more information about you. Our first new member is Dr. Jeffrey Duchin. He's health officer and uh, communicable, excuse me, communicable disease epidemiology for the public health uh, of Seattle and King County. He's a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases for the University of Washington and adjunct professor uh, of the School of Public Health. He served on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Board of Scientific Council, the Board of Directors for the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and is liaison to the Committee on Immunization Practices. Dr. thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next is uh, Dr. Jewel Mullen. Dr. Mullen is currently Associate Dean for Health Equity at Dell Medical School in uh, Austin, Texas. She's an internist, epidemiologist, and public health physician leader, and served among many roles at HHS as the former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health. Dr. Mullen also served for five years as Commissioner for the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Dr. Mullen, thank you. For joining us. Thank you. Next is Dr. Stephen. Kendra, uh, Rendernack. He's a pediatrician at Unity Point Health in Waukee, uh, Iowa. He serves as the Immunization Task Force for the Iowa Department of Public Health. And as Admiral Levine said earlier, won an Immunization Champion Award from the CDC in 2012. 
He's conducted clinical trials in vaccine safety and efficacy, including rotavirus and intracocal conjugate and pediatric combination vaccines. Dr. Rendernack, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. I look forward to working with the team. And next is Dr. Winona Stolzfus. Uh, Dr. Stolzfus is retired, but previously served as the school health officer for the New Mexico Department of Health and a regional health director for the Southeast region of New Mexico. She trained as a pediatrician, is involved in various state organizations to improve vaccine access and increase knowledge of vaccines in New Mexico. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Stolfus. Thank you. It's an honor to be part of this group. And again, I want to welcome you all, and we look forward to your contributions to our committee and to its discussions. Now let's turn to a few housekeeping items. Then we can move on to the review and approval of the minutes from the September 14, 15, 2021 meeting, followed by a high-level overview of our agenda. In terms of housekeeping, I want to make sure that everyone is aware this is a public meeting. It's being webcasted onto the HHS website. Please mute yourself when not speaking, and please do not use your camera unless you're also presenting, asking questions, or answering a question. During the discussion, I'll ask that all members and speakers to identify themselves before speaking if I didn't acknowledge you by giving you the floor. This helps the note taker and others to follow along. Throughout the day, there will be opportunities for committee discussion. If you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment, I'd ask that you send me a message through the chat feature. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not great at catching hands raised uh, as I should be. Let's now move to approval of our meeting minutes from September 14, 15. NVAC members previously received the minutes from the September 14, 15, 2021 meeting. Do any of the members want to make any corrections to those meeting minutes? Hearing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Okay, I think that's John Dunn. Uh, and can I get a second? Second, Chris Ayersman. Thank you, Chris. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Great. I think our, uh, we have uh, unanimous approval and uh, we will accept the minutes as written. Let's now talk for a moment about public comment. As always, members of the public will have the opportunity to provide a public comment by phone at about 5.30 p.m. today, Eastern Time, and about 4.45 p.m. tomorrow. Public comments are not a question and answer session. They represent an opportunity for individuals who'd like to make a statement to do so. The deadline to request a space for public comment during this meeting has passed. However, anyone can submit a written comment of up to three pages in length to nvac at hhs.gov. And I'll note that Anne has sent a number of additional public comments beyond those we have time to accommodate on the agenda to the members in anticipation of today's meeting. Now let's go over some of the highlights for today's and tomorrow's meeting. For today, uh, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers. We'll start with a panel discussion to celebrate NVAC turning 35 years old. Then we'll hear from a panel of experts on protecting the global population through immunization. After the break, we'll hear two presentations related to COVID-19 vaccination effectiveness and another presentation summarizing HHS guidance in prohibiting discrimination in COVID-19 vaccination programs. We'll end the day with another panel dedicated to vaccinating the workforce before we hear our public comments. For tomorrow, we'll host panels on the correlates of protection and strengthening immunization information and data systems. After a short break, we'll hear from a panel of experts about vaccine safety, and we'll end the day with federal agency and liaison representative updates, as well as public comment. Finally, as a reminder, please hold the next meeting date on your calendars. Our next meeting will be June 15th, 16th, 2022. And I also want to announce today that our fall meeting date will be September 22nd, 23rd of 2022. Please refer to the NVAC website for final details on these upcoming meetings. At this time, I'd like to start our first panel of the day. In celebration of NVAC turning 35, we're hosting this panel to hear from thought leaders in immunization about our history. How can we advance and how we can advance the immunization system for the next 10 to 15 years? Our first presenter really needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Walt Orenstein from Emory University is a former NVAC chair and has held many other 
critical roles in our immunization system through his career. He'll try to provide a reflection on the accomplishments and then back history to, to get us started. His remarks will then be followed by Amy Finan, the Chief Executive Officer of the Sabin Vaccine Institute, who will discuss public-private partnerships. We'll also hear from Dr. Alejandro Cravioto from the University of Mexico and the Chair of the World Health Organization's Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE. Following his presentation, Dr. Kathy Edwards from Vanderbilt University and a former INVAC member will discuss the future of COVID-19 vaccination and some of the challenges we'll face as we go forward. And finally, I'll wrap the panel with my thoughts on future opportunities for INVAC over the next 10 to 15 years. Dr. Orenstein, nice to see you on the camera. You have the floor uh, and please begin your presentation. Thank you very much. My goal today is to review the history of NVAC, how it was established, critical issues that led to NVAC as an important committee, and to illustrate with examples some selected NVAC recommendations. I only have a few minutes, so for those who are really interested in the history, in 2018, a review of the first 30 years of NVAC was published in Vaccine with Kimberly M. Thompson as the first author. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, the NVAC was established in 1987. Its first meeting was in 1988. The purpose uh, in the legislation was to advise and make recommendations to the Assistant Secretary for Health, who was designated to serve as the director of the National Vaccine Program on matters related to program responsibilities. Next slide, please. Uh, the National Vaccine Program was created as part of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, which uh, implemented a no-fault vaccine injury compensation program. This was led by an organization, now uh, Dissatisfied Parents Together, who were concerned that vaccines had harmed them and that society had an obligation to compensate uh, children. Uh, and at, also at that time, we were having serious problems with potential vaccine supply. At least one manufacturer of the DPT vaccine stopped another delayed production, and the legislators took advantage of the opportunity by adding to the legislation the establishment of the National Vaccine Program. And part of the act included the need to develop a national vaccine plan and the establishment of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. It also led to establishment of the National Vaccine Program Office, now the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. The NVPO and NVAC were created to implement the National Vaccine Plan. And the idea really came from staff working with Congressman Waxman, a representative from California at the time, about the coordinating the role of all of the federal agencies involved in vaccine and immunization processes from basic scientific research to vaccine development, vaccine delivery, and ultimately disease control. Next slide, please. Initially, NVAC struggled to find purpose and direction. The agencies themselves weren't that interested in it, they felt they had what they needed. And then the second NVAC chair, D.A. Henderson, who led the smallpox eradication effort for WHO and who was a dean of the Hopkins School of Public Health, uh, was ch the second chair of NVAC. And we had a major measles resurgence between 1989 and 1991 in which there were over 55,000 cases of measles reported, over 11,000 hospitalizations, and 123 deaths. And he thought NVAC could make a major contribution 
to preventing future outbreaks of measles, uh, resurgences, of, and other vaccine-preventable diseases. And in fact, this measles white paper implemented specific recommendations through the Clinton administration when we got a presidential initiative on immunization uh, starting in 1993, the Childhood Immunization Initiative, or CII. The measles uh, resurgence and white paper gave purpose to early to NVAC, and the resurgence was viewed as a public health crisis, giving more credibility to NVAC's purpose. Next slide, please. So what were some of the critical aspects? One, it was pivotal because we had a resurgence. We had media coverage of people hospitalized, people dying from measles. And it was an effort to get this important recommendations to keep policy makers recommended by RAND. Link the increases to a failure to provide vaccine to vulnerable children on the recommended schedule. And it identified barriers to vaccination and offered a set of possible solutions, many of which were acted on. For example, one of the strategies was to create a standards for of immunization practices. And that was because diagnostic work on measles cases found, for example, that many opportunities to vaccinate were being missed by providers. And to establish standards to avoid those missed opportunities were part of the immunization standards. Also, there were major concerns with administration of vaccine costs that were not covered particularly in public problems through federal uh, programs, through federal funds. And so it made the point of the need to not only cover vaccine costs, but implementation costs. And many attribute the development of the Vaccines for Children program to the recommendations in the measles white paper. Next slide, please. And this is the second version of the National Vaccine Plan, just to give you an idea of what some of the aspects were. So it starts from the beginning, develop new and improved vaccines. One of the major concerns has been vaccine safety. NVAC has focused a lot on that and made recommendations in the plan for enhancing the vaccine safety system. Another was to enhance communications to help inform vaccine decision-making. Fourth was to ensure a stable supply of access to and better use of recommended vaccines. So for example, removing cost as a barrier to vaccination. And fifth was the recognition of the need that we are a global community and that vaccination was important to help countries around the world, not only for humanitarian interests, but for our own domestic health security. And they also developed then a national vaccine implementation plan. Next, next slide, please. So there are at least 30 recommendations, and I will go through them quickly here to just give you an idea of some of the focus that people did. I've already mentioned the measles uh, pa uh, white paper, which was the first one. The first national vaccine plan came about in 1994. There were a number of reports on adult immunization because clearly our efforts in adult immunization are not anywhere near as good as childhood immunization and our coverage rates are lower. So the NVAC tackled that multiple times. Another aspect was to enhance research and to solidify the collaboration between public and private entities, uh, ways to sustain success, vaccine safety I've already mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, how do we decide on which new vaccines to develop? Enhancing the supply security, uh, revisions of practices, financing of vaccines, uh, again, to assure access and to assure development and to assure that cost was not a barrier. 
focus on immunization information systems to track who is immunized, who is not, and to make the data available for individual care as well as the programmatic decisions. I already mentioned the National Vaccine Plan in 2010, uh, uh, further efforts on adult immunization. And most of the recommendations you'll see deal with implementation. And that's because I was at CDC at the time. We were thinking of developing a committee like the ACIP for program considerations. Well, the ACIP dealt with technical immunization recommendations. And then we decided that NVAC would be the logical committee and we didn't need to develop a new committee. And one of the things that came out early on was the critical functions of the Section 317 Immunization Grant Program. Next slide, please. And then, again, more on adult immunization, more on the Section 317 program, updates on standards for both adult and pediatric, uh, enhancing maternal immunization. Uh, we have already discussed the issue of overcoming vaccine hesitancy and causing and, and uh, labeling the plan, not by the problem it was addressing, but the solution, and that was to build vaccine confidence. There was a mid-course evaluation uh, of the vaccine plan in 2017. Next slide, please. Strengthening the effectiveness uh, of efforts to enhance HPV vaccination coverage. Um, another uh, effort uh, to enhance development uh, and then building a confidence in COVID-19 vaccines and preparing recommendations and immunization equity. So that's quite a, a number of recommendations that were made over 30 year, 35 years. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, one was the role of vaccines in combating antibiotic resistant bacteria. People clearly thought about bacteria, more antibiotic developments, but we clearly saw a role for vaccines. So one of the recommendations there was the committee strongly encouraged the ASH to communicate um, the, uh, to the secretary and the uh, 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 combating antimicrobial resistance uh, group uh, efforts to stimulate not only development of antibiotics, but new and better vaccines. Also, we propose incentives to be flexible enough to apply a diverse range of technologies to move toward better solutions, including vaccines. And when incentives are found to be cross-setting, uh, additional alternative incentives should be proposed, or, or, or actually when they're not found to be cross-cutting. And the NENVAC report was added to report to the president on combating antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. Another is Global Immunization Working Group. Uh, Dr. Cravioto will be spending uh, a lot more on that. But this was published in a whole issue of public health reports. And again, looking at tackling time-limited opportunities to complete polio eradication and reduce measles and rubella adverse health consequences. And recommending that the ASH emphasize that political and public support is fundamental to achieving those goals for polio, measles, and rubella. And achieving those goals would be a monumental public health achievement. Next slide, please. And the last report I wanted to mention is the Vaccine Confidence Working Group. And uh, uh, this was the, the, the one of the recommendations is that healthcare providers, immunization programs, and those involved in promoting recommended vaccinations actively reinforce that according to the ACIP schedule as the social norm, not the exception. And that misperceptions that vaccination in line with ACIP is not the norm should be addressed. And I think one of the more important recommend, sub recommendations of that was to create a repository of evidence-based best practices for informing, educating, and communicating with parents, providers, and others 
to foster and increase vaccine confidence. And so those are the key points I wanted to make. There's a lot more, and I guess that article by Kimberly Thompson is a help for those who really want more detail, and I'd be happy to answer questions when the time comes for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Orenstein. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, Amy Finan from the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Uh, Amy, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much and good afternoon. And thanks for the opportunity to discuss the critical role of public-private partnerships in sustaining research development and delivery of vaccines for all. As uh, stated, my name is Amy Finan. I'm the CEO of the Sabin Vaccine Institute, a not-for-profit global health organization. And if I could have the next slide, please. Our mission, simply put, is to make vaccines more accessible, enable innovation, and expand immunization across the globe. With about 50 employees, we are a small organization, but one with outsized impact. If I could have the next slide, please. COVID-19 has really highlighted the agility of public-private partnerships to respond in times of crisis. But how must these partnerships be reimagined for the future to be sustainable in peacetime and to solve complex health challenges that face the world, especially by those people living in low and middle income countries who are most disproportionately affected by endemic diseases and health crises. Next slide, please. Public-private partnerships play a fundamental and important role in pandemic preparedness and ensuring health and economic security. The current pandemic has only further punctuated the need to permanently transform the vaccine R&D R &D ecosystem. In a recent report, the Sabin Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group describes the need to rebuild regionally distributed R&D capacity throughout low and middle income countries to future-proof economic and global health security against emerging infectious diseases and threats. Partnerships play a critical role in that transformed vaccine ecosystem through distribution of risk and diversity of commitments, assets, infrastructure, capabilities, and priorities. Next slide, please. Traditionally, the component stakeholders of the public-private partnerships are comprised of governments, pharma and biotechs, investors, philanthropy, NGOs, and or academia. Furthermore, most of these organizations are based in or represent high-income countries. However, in the new era of public-private partnerships, national-level leaders in low- and middle-income countries, as well as local LMIC-based industries, investors, NGOs, civil society, philanthropy, and academia must be represented. And when partnerships are more inclusive, of LMIC participation. This is when we believe they achieve the highest level of success. Next slide, please. Public-private partnerships have an especially important role in the development of vaccines for endemic diseases that primarily exist in low and middle income countries. Also known as unincentivized vaccines or global public goods, they have limited commercial value, but they benefit society. This the partnership model allows for the risk to be distributed among the partners instead of incurred by one entity alone. The next slide, please. So these are four super well-known public-private partnerships that have played critical roles in the past health crisis and the one that we're facing now. Next slide. This will be rapid fire. Gavi, established in 2000, has, uh, was the outgrowth of the Children's Vaccine Initiative that was formed a decade earlier. Gavi has helped vaccinate nearly half the world's children, has supported the introduction of more than 495 vaccines into the EPI schedules and LMICs, and most recently has played a critical role as the co-leader of COVAX. Many of the same thought leaders that brought Gavi to fruition were also behind the inception of CEPI. Next slide, please. Established in 2006, BART has taken on significant amount of risk in targeting and developing vaccines to address the 21st century health threats. BARDA has been instrumental in spurring innovations by partnering with industry and nonprofits, including Sabin. And under these novel partnerships, BARDA has supported FDA approval and licensure of 61 products to date. Next slide, please. And CEPI, born in 2016 and out of the Ebola crisis, CEPI has actively funded the development of over 20 vaccine candidates against priority pathogens, including chikungunya, Lassa, MERS, Nipah, and Rift Valley fever. 
And as we all know, CEPI has played a critical role in the development and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines as a co-leader of COVAX. Next slide. And finally, I would be remiss not to highlight the NIH. The NIH plays a foundational role in early stage research, such as the work from Dr. Barney Graham's lab, which provided the backbone for Moderna's mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. Public-private partnerships have and unique roles in different stages of the vaccine ecosystem. First, upstream, partnerships foster innovation, they drive the vaccine agenda, advanced vaccine candidates, especially for endemic diseases in low and middle income countries. Next, once those vaccines are developed, PPPs with the appropriate partners must then engage in downstream activities related to advocacy efforts for inclusion in national routine immunization schedules and in the rollout successfully to get shots into arms, our ultimate goal. We're also learning that partnerships play an increasingly important role in building trust and acceptance of vaccines within low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight a few very different examples of public-private partnerships driving vaccine innovation with vaccines at all different stages of development. So just a few months ago, and after many, many, many years of work, the RTSS vaccine made history by becoming the first malaria vaccine recommended for wide, widespread use by the WHO. This Groundbreaking vaccine was developed by a public-private partnership with the lead partners being GSK, PATH, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Walter Reed Army Institute for Research. This is an example of a vaccine for endemic disease that primarily exists in low-income countries and one that serves the global public good, but will not generate large returns on the investment. As such, the partners have distributed the risk across the entire uh, stream. While we have yet to develop an HIV and universal influenza vaccines, the research from these vaccines has catalyzed innovation. Public-private partnerships supported by IAVI, BARDA, uh, NIH, and the Gates Foundation, just to name a few, have been instrumental in accelerating the development of these, quote, holy grail vaccines. Notably, partnership investments in HIV and universal influenza vaccine research contributed greatly to the mRNA platform technology being leveraged for the development of the COVID-19 vaccines. And finally, I'd like to note Sabin's participation in a public-private partnership to develop vaccines against Ebola, Ebola Sudan and Marburg. In 2019, and with technologies in license from GSK and the NIH, Sabin received funding from BARDA to support this development project. And we are pleased to report that our Ebola Sudan and Marburg vaccines are scheduled to enter phase two clinical trials in Africa later this year. Importantly, the two licensed vaccines for Ebola Zaire, one from Merck and the other from J&J, &J, were also developed in partnership with BARDA. Next slide, please. So the role of public-private partnerships doesn't end after the vaccine is successfully developed. In fact, play an equally critical role in the uptake and delivery of vaccines. We've seen the shortcomings of this play out during the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, where there has been a lack of emphasis placed on partnerships for the delivery of the vaccines. Next slide, please. Typhoid, however, is an example of a disease where public-private partnerships were critical to the successful rollout and acceptance of the vaccines, particularly the typhoid conjugate vaccines. Partners work to demonstrate the true burden of the disease, and with these data in hand, help to drive evidence-based decision-making that led to successful recommendations by the WHO and Gavi, as well as national policymakers who are prioritizing the vaccines for their own citizens. Sabin was proud to play a, a small role in this partnership work in two specific areas. First, we conducted epidemiological studies on the burden of typhoid disease in Southeast Asia evidence that was key to the 2017 pre-qualification by the WHO. And second, Sabin heads up the Coalition Against Typhoid, a group that is leading the charge to support the uptake of the typhoid conjugate vaccines. This progress was made possible by combined commitments and investment from public and private sector actors, including academia, philanthropy, and manufacturers, many of which are located in low and middle income countries. 
Currently, SAVEN is not directly participating in the rollout of the RTSS malaria vaccine, but we certainly are hopeful to see similar successes with this vaccine as we have with the typhoid conjugate vaccines. Next slide, please. Public-private partnerships with visible participation from low- and middle-income country representatives may also play a positive role in vaccine acceptance. Vaccines developed and endorsed by scientists, manufacturers, health workers, and cultural and faith leaders with ties to the local community may decrease barriers associated with vaccine hesitancy and actually increase trust in vaccines. Sabin's Vaccine Acceptance and Demand Program continues to surface findings that will reveal how trust in the acceptance of vaccine hinges on collaborative engagement of community leaders. Next slide, please. In conclusion, it's critical that the public-private partnerships are expanded and sustained in peacetime by addressing endemic diseases disproportionately impacting people in low- and middle-income countries, but that they can then pivot rapidly to address a crisis. These partnerships should continue to focus on vaccine R&D, but also need to continue to bolster work downstream on the vaccination efforts. Most importantly, low- and middle-income country representatives must be active participants in public and private partnerships. We need to be more inclusive and ensure more seats at the table specifically for them. Low- and middle-income country stakeholders provide regional, country, and local insights representing the needs of their citizens and building trust in vaccines, moving us closer to our mutual goal of getting shots into arms and protecting human life. Thank you very much. I would be delighted to answer some questions and engage in discussion uh, after the panel is finished up. Thank you very much, Amy. Our next presenter will be Dr. Alejandro Cravioto from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México and the SAGE Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be a participant in this <clears throat> anniversary meeting. Um, I would like to give um, a presentation about a more global view of what is being done and, and how I see the participation of everybody in it. I would like to stress that I'm an advisor to the World Health Organization, but I do not speak for the organization per se. The next one, please. When I was uh, getting ready to participate in here, I asked my friend Walt Orenstein uh, a bit of advice on how or where to focus the attention. And he sent me this very interesting publication about the work that MVAC does and, and the future of the uh, project and the committee within the, the scope of its work in the, United, in the United States. And the first thing I read in the next one was this first paper. Um, in which it clearly stated that the mission of the Department of Health and Human Services is to protect and promote the health of the people in the United States, but also that the well-being of those within our country have to be realized between, be, in a global context, taking into account both the threats and opportunities that are found outside of the United States. And I think this was the clearest message of where I think the future of all of us depends on the work that we can do together. The next one. Public health threats are nothing new. We had a big scare in 2009 with the H1N1 outbreak, which started in my own country and spread quickly to the rest of the world. It was contained in a way that showed a degree of efficiency. Vaccines were developed, uh, but not well used. And all the lessons learned were apparently put in a number of documents to make us aware of what needed to be done when we face the next, the next threat. Diseases, although don't come just as pandemics, in the next one, the United States, uh, as has been said before, has faced a number of increase in a domestic type of uh, infections, especially of diseases that supposedly had been under control like measles due to the importation of cases coming from other parts of the world and within communities that have not had the vaccine coverage necessary to make sure that the children with the, these infections were not severely ill. The next one. 
But our biggest threat, of course, has been the confronting, uh, confronting ourselves in the past two years of this new uh, coronavirus infection, which really has shown how ill-prepared we have been to confront something that started in one part of the world and spread quickly to the rest. The next one. Despite the restrictions about traveling done early on when the infection started, it was clear that that was not going to defend us from having infections in all parts of the world in the next one. And as we have seen so far from a few cases at the beginning of the pandemic, we have now millions of cases and millions of people dead around the world due to the infection. What has been positive about this? I would say three things. The next one. The first has been the immediate collaboration of research groups around the world to try to confront the problem and to share information rapidly and willingly to be able to then have the necessary tools to control the problem. This includes, of course, the work that has been done by private industry in the development of both drugs and vaccines that has been placed openly uh, and published quickly so that the, avail the, the information has been made available to make policy recommendations about the use of these products. The next one has been the access to all the information published so far by all the major journals in the world that have had an open access system that has allowed us to have the information we need without the necessary payment for the subscriptions to these publications, which has been a huge advantage for everything. And also the publication of articles before they go through a peer review system, which has given us a glimpse of what is coming up, uh, either good or not so good, in the sense of being able to cope with a huge amount of information that needs to be assessed to be able to control the problem. The next one, of course, has been the development of tools that have allowed us to have a better surveillance system around the world that allows us to detect the cases and to be able to make sure that people are safe, both inside their country and when they need to travel. And of course, in the next one, it, what has been amazing has been the speed at which vaccines have been developed, uh, drugs also, in the sense of how uh, these products can be uh, tested and used for the control of the pandemic. While the companies were already uh, producing the, the, the vaccines, thanks to the support of countries like the United States that put up the funding, uh, the facilities to produce these products were made concomitantly so that once the vaccines were approved by the FDA and recommended by the ACIP, they could be rolled out the next day to go from the factory to the arms of the people that needed them. This has made an, a huge difference in the sense of how we deal with the vaccines. And thanks to the efforts that everybody has done, both in the production, the testing, and the way that the evidence has been reviewed to be able to make the necessary recommendations. We have not only the three that are in use, but six more that the World Health Organization has recommended for use around the world and are now part of the armamentarium we have for the control of the infection. We have four more in the pipeline that we will discuss and review in SAGE in the next uh, weeks or months, so that that will make a huge total of around 12 products that we'll be able then to follow uh, and see how they behave and, and uh, support the control of the infection. The next one. The availability of, of the, the vaccines, however, has not been even, and we have had an equity problem, which has been so far the most uh, difficult part of the use of these vaccines. While some countries have had access to multiple doses of these pro products, others are still waiting for, to receive the first vaccines through the systems that have been set in place. And we still have a large number of unvaccinated people in many parts of the world. The next one. The system that was put in place that uh, Dr. Uh, Finan talked about, COVAX, has worked well with the supply that has been available and under the conditions that have been set up. 
with the experience that the Gavi Alliance and UNICEF have, the setup of this system in which both the people who are willing to pay for the vaccines and those that will be supplied without the need to pay for them have been receiving doses so far that have been allowing them to start their vaccination programs one way or another. The next one. The benefit that we see is that in the next months, we will have a ramping up of supply, which is a good news in the sense of how we will be able now to be able to distribute these vaccines throughout the countries that are in need to continue their vaccination programs. And in difference to how we done it before, this time it will be at the country's uh, request according to their needs and their size of the populations and not necessarily just sending the vaccines that are available for them to use as, as you, uh, possible. The next one. Now, part of this COVAX facility, of course, have been donations coming from many countries. And in that sense, the generosity of the United States has always been clear, being the country that has supplied the most vaccines for this uh, purpose. However, as you can see, the numbers are far away from the ones needed to be able to reach the, what it was expected to be a 40% coverage of the population by the end of last year, and what we hope will be a 70% coverage by the middle of this year. Uh, that will then allow us really to follow what Dr. Tedros, the head of the WHO, has said, that for all of us to be safe, everyone has to be safe. The next one. On the other hand, there have been two initiatives that are important. One is to set up the facilities to be able to do at least field finishing of vaccines produced somewhere else in parts of the world that do not have these facilities to date. One is Latin America, in which the Pan American Health Organization has started an initiative. And the other is for the whole continent of Africa in the sense of how they can actually produce their own vaccines under agreements with the producers of the products in other parts of the world that will be far more easy to do than going against patents, which seems to be a, a much longer way and more difficult to attain. The next one. The other thing in the next one, please. Dr. Cravioto, are you still there? Dr. Cravioto, I think you're having some technical difficulties. If you want to try turning off your camera, that should help. I'll turn it off. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, the other thing that is needed and is clear is international leadership. Uh, the consorted effort of people who are at the front of governments of countries and the working together towards having a single policy is essential for anything that we do in the future. We feel that that has happened so far, but needs to be strengthened and used in a much more consorted way. Something that has come up recently, which shows the importance of this last factor in the next one, please is this paper published by the, the Institute of Health Metrics and Education in Seattle, which shows that of the things that we had set in practice as preparedness for a pandemic, most of them have failed. One, because they didn't consider other issues related to both personal factors, such as health, demographics, but also the other factors which mean our relationship with each other and our relationships with our governments. It is incredible, if we go to the next one, that things related to the trust in a government, that trust in each other and the degree of corruption in a country are more related to the way the vaccines have been able to curb the case fatality rate in 171 countries that many other the things that we had put in place to be able to cope with the pandemic. This clearly shows that health promotion to modify risks and community investment to increase trust are associated with a reduction of deaths more than other apparent interventions 
that have been proposed so far. Preparedness also means the support and financing of international organizations like the WHO that needs to be strengthened and not substituted by new parallel organizations that will probably also only increase the bureaucracy, but not necessarily the efficiency needed to confront and control these and future pandemics. I would leave it there and thank you very much again for your invitation. Thank you very much, Dr. Cravioto. Next will be Dr. Kathy Edwards from Vanderbilt University. Kathy, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, and I'm so pleased to be here and celebrating this important birthday. Um, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about the past, the present, but really talk about the future and how I think that NVAC is uniquely poised to address some of our challenges. Next slide. These are my disclosures. Next slide. So for those of us who practice uh, pediatrics, um, to remind us what the vaccine schedule looked like in, uh, in 1983, shortly before the, the inception of NVAC, there were really only two or three vaccines that were routinely given, DTP, OPV, MMR. Uh, next slide. This is the current 2021 child and adolescent immunization schedule. And now you'll see that there are many more vaccines that we administer than those initial three. And we have seen the enormous impact of these new vaccines. When I uh, go to the wards, we no longer have cases of bacterial meningitis, rare cases of, of bacterial pneumonias because of the important impact of the vaccines that we have, have developed licensed and implemented in the lifespan of NVAC. Next slide. However, it's important for us not to rest on our laurels. And, and I think that the enormous burden of neonatal deaths that occur were outlined in this wonderful paper in Lancet uh, discussing the sustainable development goals. And neonatal deaths from sepsis and pneumonia are very common. And indeed, uh, NVAC has had a major role in promoting maternal vaccinations, obviously delivering babies that already have antibody against important pathogens before they're even delivered by their mother's uh, transplacental antibody transfer is an important role, an important tool that we have in preventing disease. We also know that there are, are diseases that we don't have say, uh, vaccines that are totally protective, such as tuberculosis, AIDS, and we know that the malaria vaccine has recently been, been uh, uh, implemented. So we have a number of important challenges that we need to address in addition to those that we have solved. Next slide. Just as Alejandra mentioned, we also understand that the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID outbreak has given us some enormously important tools. We have some new vaccine approaches that we have never been used, that have never been used widely before, including the mRNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, recombinant, vectored, inactivated, and even live attenuated vaccines. And the promise that those vaccines have shown uh, in terms of, of allowing us to provide um, new approaches are, are really breathtaking. Certainly mRNA vaccines for other diseases such as CMV and mRNA are, and RSV are ongoing and offer a great promise. One of the benefits of the COVID outbreak. Next slide. We in the United States have three current vaccines against the Wuhan virus that are, are issued either uh, a BLA or an EUA, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the J&J. &J. They all have very good efficacy and certainly excellent efficacy for prevention of hospitalization and severe disease. They do come with a punch, and I have been um, had the opportunity uh, to help in assessing the punch that we have in terms of the vaccine safety uh, over the last two years. We do know that there are some unique adverse events that we have seen, such as anaphylaxis and myocarditis, 
and the thrombocytopenia and thrombocytosis that we see with the J&J &J vaccines and also the Guillain-Barre. And we need to understand why those happen with these specific vaccines and really need to uh, make sure that the NIH and other funding agencies help us in addressing the important questions of why about vaccine safety. Next slide. I want to spend just a few moments talking about safety because that has been a mission of NVAC. It must continue to be a mission and the safety and the assiduousness of which we pursue that must also be communicated. The vSafe system, which depends upon uh, uh, the iPhone or an app, has really been powerful uh, in assessing vaccine safety. And my assessment has been that it had a major role in the acceptance of pregnant women uh, for the COVID vaccines because they so actively participated and so rapidly that information was disseminated. So as we go forward and we think about vaccine safety, both in, in the United States, but globally using apps um, and using our, our cell phones to address safety and to monitor it really must be an important part of the picture. Next slide. The VAERS system has had many, many requ requests and, and uh, uh, earning warning uh, to, uh, to the system, and those have also been very carefully assessed and provided us signals, certainly not causation, but signals, which have been markedly helpful in assessing adverse events with COVID. Next slide. Also, the uh, strong infrastructure in the ISO units at the CDC, uh, including the VSD, the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which has over 12 billion participants and in nine integrated healthcare systems, as shown here, have provided real-time data links and databases that have uh, precise measurements of vaccines administered, precise measurements of adverse events that occur, and the allowance of the ability to carefully review those and to understand uh, the, the epidemiology of the adverse events and to see, indeed, if they are more common than one would expect. Next slide. I have also been uh, very honored to participate in the 24 seven um, CESA assessment project where we are uh, available to address questions from providers. Uh, and we have been doing that since the end of, of December in 2020. Um, and again, providing the, the safety and the confidence and the communication that we need to have to make sure that the providers understand uh, that how seriously the vaccine safety is being assessed and how important we feel that their, their role in this is indeed. Next slide. We know, however, this has been an incredibly difficult task. And for someone who has spent a number of decades working on influenza, which I thought was a difficult task with, with every year things changing, SARS-CoV-2 variants have, have changed at a breathtaking rate and have make, made our difficulties much, much greater, have shown us the importance, just as Dr. Caviotto said, at, of, uh, uh, of, of sharing data, sharing viruses, and understanding the epidemiology and the burden. And this must continue as we go forward. And we must use this example also to assess the changeability of other vaccine preventable diseases as well. Next slide. We know that the vaccines have had uh, waning immunity. We also know that the vaccines have, have had um, uh, different efficacy and effectiveness against the Delta and the Omicron variants. Um, as you see in this slide, you'll see that, that with both the Delta shown in, uh, in the darker box, um, that the effectiveness for prevention of infection does wane, is, is boosted by the booster. Uh, but this protection against infection with the Omicron shown in the gray circles is less. These data from the UK and also the sharing of data from all over the world have been very important in us assessing how vaccines work and how we assess when we need boosters and when we need to consider that maybe the strains must be changed or should be changed as the variants emerge. Next slide. 
We also know that just as as, uh, it was mentioned earlier, that we do have hesitancy. And the hesitancy that we see with the vaccines is not equally distributed. These are data that were recently presented uh, at the ACIP meeting that show the percentage of people in the United States, 18 years of, of age and older, who have received just a single dose of COVID vaccine. As you can see here, there is a disparity in those that have received the largest numbers of doses, uh, the American Indians uh, and Native populations, almost 70 percent, whereas in the Black population, closer to 45 percent. Next slide. As someone who lives in the South, we also know that there are disparities uh, in terms of vaccine population uptake by where we live. And as you can see here in our Northwestern and Northeastern states, we have much higher vaccine uptake than we do in the Southeastern. So this is an issue and one that we must clearly address. Next slide. When we dissect the reasons for those remaining unvaccinated, um, most of the major concerns are concern about side effects. So we need to make sure, and and that needs to help us with their wisdom in trying to communicate to uh, the population that we have looked and very carefully looking at side effects, and they have been remarkably uncommon. We also need to help some help in in making sure that the message that these vaccines um, are safe are trusted. Just as we just heard, it's important who the messengers are. And we must also make sure that people understand that we are assessing short term adverse events as well. The reasons for remaining unvaccinated are very important, but we also need to make sure, just as Admiral Levine so articulately uh, mentioned, that the messengers or the people that are giving these messages to each individual population group often must look like them, must often be of their community so that they are trusted and do believe that what is being told is indeed correct. Next slide. So in conclusion, over the past 35 years, we have shown one more time that vaccines prevent morbidity and mortality, both nationally and globally. They are an amazing success story. The COVID pandemic has provided new vaccine approaches to control previously uncontrolled pathogens and also to improve our current vaccines. We must use that knowledge. We must work with our funding agencies and public-private partnerships to use the knowledge from COVID to advance new vaccines. Vaccine safety must be rigidly and vigorously assessed and communicated very clearly to public con- to restore public confidence, not only for COVID, but for all of our vaccines. And that must be a focus that NVAC has in terms of vaccine confidence. Vaccine hesitancy is common, varies by race, age, and location, as I have shown you, and must be a focus of a lot of attention. We also must make sure that the reasons that that people, uh, that communication is not optimal are studied in a methodologic uh, uh, rigid way so that we can learn new ways to communicate. And the adverse events that we see must also be dissected scientifically so we can understand why these happen and how they might be uh, eliminated. And finally, we need to have research into the methods to increase confidence and also research in implementation, not only in delivering vaccine to children, but also to the adults, as Walt so so clearly outlined. So thank you so much. We have many achievements. Um, We have done an amazing job during COVID, but we have a lot of challenges ahead. and, And I look forward to the next decades for NVAC leading the way. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll now hand the uh, baton off to this Hopkins guy. Uh, You can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm going to talk for just a moment about where I see us going uh, moving forward. Uh, As Walt said earlier, you know, a lot of activity has come out of uh, NVAC. 
Uh, these are some of the reports that have come out uh, since I first uh, accepted my nomination to the committee uh, and have had the privilege of being involved with some of these teams to develop some of these reports. Um, we've got lots of opportunities going forward. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So as I see uh, our future over this next few years, I think the themes that are most important to me and I think are gonna make the greatest difference fall into these four areas. Innovation, I think is absolutely critical. I think vaccine equity, we've got tremendous opportunities for as, as we've seen multiple examples of in some of the earlier presentations. I think vaccine confidence and communications, again, we have tremendous opportunities for. And I think we have to recognize that we've got a, a great variety of input in our collaborations in NVAC between the members of the committee, the federal staffers, our liaison and, and uh, other representatives but I think we have to recognize we're part of a global community. And if we're gonna make a difference with vaccine preventable disease, we have to think beyond the borders of the United States. Next slide, please. So as I think about innovation, I think about how do we meet the needs of our society to continue the search to develop safe and effective vaccines to meet the threats posed by both known and potential vaccine preventable diseases. And innovation is necessary and we should support innovation along each of these different sub areas. You know, in vaccines, we have to think about current and novel vaccine platforms, targeting current and future threats. We need to think about translating the lessons we've learned from COVID-19 to other diseases, improving our current vaccines and what immediately comes to mind to me are pertussis, mumps and influenza encouraging research to improve the understanding of immune response to vaccines and immune quality of protection, encouraging research to understand the mechanisms of vaccine adverse events, as uh, Dr. Edwards pointed out a moment ago. I think adjuvants are an important area to facilitate robust and durable immune response while also assuring that we maintain vaccine safety as a critical element of our thought process. Vaccine delivery platform. You know, if we can move toward uh, micro needle or needle free delivery systems, uh, I think that gives us a real opportunity. I had not realized until the last couple of years how great a disease that needle hesitancy is among our populations. I thought of it as a pediatric problem, but I'm understanding that that's also an issue of many of our adults. You know, mucosal and topical immunization could bring us some real opportunity. I think it's important we recognize cold chain and other uh, vaccine delivery uh, potentials. People don't all live in cities where they have immediate access to negative 70 degree freezers. We need to make sure that we've got cold chain processes and delivery processes to get vaccine to where our patients live. And then finally, collaborations are important. COVID-19 has repeatedly reinforced the need to be a strong global partner if we're to effectively prevent and respond to vaccine preventable diseases. Go to the next slide, please. Vaccine equity is, in my view, probably our principal challenge. We need to have safe and effective vaccines available to all people in need in order to maximize the benefits to our healthy society. To facilitate recovery in our routine vaccination of uh, losses we have achieve maximal benefit. Dr. Hopkins, we're receiving some feedback from your line. I, I'm wondering if you have something near your speaker that might be scraping at it. Uh, I will try to make sure that I don't. <laughs> Thank you. We need to achieve maximal benefits and minimize missed opportunities in childhood vaccination, what some might think of as BFC plus. Uh, we have uh, opportunities to catch some children that may not be addressed at present. We need to address vaccine coverage gaps and move toward an agenda of vaccines for all, addressing some of the challenges with many adults not having easy access and low cost vaccines. And again, supporting collaborations ongoing and new to reach and protect people globally from vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide, please. And immunization communication remains a tremendous challenge to getting true and reliable information about vaccines and vaccination to the public in an evidence-based manner to support routine vaccination and improvements in public health. Similarly, misinformation and false rhetoric need to be labeled as such in order to support the health of populations. 
We need to help our population, help individuals learn that safe and effective vaccines are available and how the importance of vaccination. We need to facilitate efforts to support and grow vaccine confidence, to address the growing challenge of vaccine hesitance, and support collaborations to address the growing impact of anti-science and anti-vaccine misinformation in communities, communities, in media, and on social media. If you go to the final slide, please. And again, the collaborations uh, that we have available to us uh, through this committee, through our uh, group at the Office of Infectious Disease Policy, through HHS, uh, through our uh, partners in public health agencies across our country and around the world. Um, I think it's important that our meetings remain open to the public and that we listen to our public comments uh, as we think about moving toward the future. And with that, I will stop and uh, uh, open us up to any questions or comments to any of the members of our panel. And if anybody has a question or comment, if you want to uh, send me a note in the chat or uh, um, just uh, unmute yourself and, and speak up. Hey, Bob, Tim Cook here. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for all those great presentations. And uh, I'm just struck by uh, how interesting it is for NVAC, I guess, in its 33rd year to have this global pandemic arrive. And uh, we've obviously you know, reacted to that with some different reports. And um, it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes after the pandemic uh, fades and becomes endemic. Um, I appreciated the uh, comments on innovation. You know, I, I represent the biotech industry, so I'm very interested in early stage financing, which five years ago for infectious disease vaccines was really poor. And um, that's one of the reasons I joined the NVAC. But, uh, you know, obviously there's been a lot of funding going into vaccines and COVID has transformed i think the image of vaccine many investors are getting back into vaccines not just for covid but other things the uh, ability to see what's happened with mrna platform the uh, recombinant viral vectors and adjuvants has been really stunning and you know it's been uh, an opportunity to try a lot of these different modalities head to head so i'm i'm looking forward to the future um, and and looking uh, at innovation and, and how the, the funding uh, will go over time and certainly hoping that the great success we've seen with COVID will spill into other areas, including bacterial vaccines against AMR threats and others. But uh, just uh, thank you all for the, uh, for the celebration. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. Hey, Bob, this is David Fleming. Thanks so much for your presentation, and thanks also to all of the other presenters. In some ways, um, we have a rich potential agenda of issues um, that are ones that need solving as we look into the near future. I'm, I'm interested in knowing from you and from Walt and others who know NVAC where you see as the Venn diagram, which is the crossover between those things that are important in, in, in immunization and those things that NVAC is most able to influence. We can't do everything. And so where would you, um, just to challenge us a little bit, what are, among all of these issues, what are the top several that you think would be most critical for NVAC to have a voice in? And I open that up to any of the other presenters as well, and particularly Walt, um, with his rich history of NVAC, but all of them. thank you. I think those those are very very important questions. I think I would sort. I, I think some of the things that NVAC has done extremely well, and I think needs to continue, deals with the implementation side, and that is the vaccine confidence issues and the uh, overcoming barriers, and also efforts to try and get the support, in my opinion, for adult immunization. I think that uh, all of the things are important, but I think those are where NVAC has been effective in working with state and local health departments and others uh, to advocate 
for it would be important because I think part of the issue, in my opinion, would be to get greater publicity and greater interest from NBAC recommendations and that they just don't die in a, in, uh, in a uh, published document. There's a need for continuing efforts and a need to work uh, to uh, enhance uh, th those efforts. I think in terms of vaccine development, um, I think uh, NVAC has made a number of things in the past. Uh, I'm not sure how effective that has been, given what has already been done with vaccine development. But I think we need to somehow uh, try and use the COVID example to uh, say we've got to be prepared and we need to do it and we can do it. I, I think I'd agree with, with everything you said, Walt. Um, looks like Jeff Dushin has got his hand up. Jeff, uh, as a new member, we'll give you the privilege of the last statement uh, before we move on to our next panel. Oh, gee, I was nervous enough um, being on thin ice asking my first question at my first meeting. Um, no pressure. No but pressure. I appreciate it. I, I wanted to follow up a little bit on David's question. You know, I was, I've been thinking about all the amazing work that was presented this morning and all the, you know, the, the incredibly complex and sort of um, very immunization specific issues that NVAC has been dealing with. And, you know, here at the local public health level, one of the things that we're challenged with is when we work with community, they don't necessarily want us to come with one thing at a time. You know, even during COVID, we heard, well, where were you? you know, with diabetes, where were you, you know, with heart disease, we've got so many disparities and so much suffering related to social determinants of health, which are a public health problem. I'm wondering if there's been any thought about how, you know, improving immunization confidence, improving immunization access and acceptance um, fits into the bigger picture of you know, uh, addressing community health needs and um, some some of the overlap with the other, you know, um, causes of disparities that need to be addressed simultaneously. I don't know if I articulated that as well as I could have. Well, I think you know, it, my comment to that would be that I think that fits in very well with what we saw in the last few weeks when it was pointed out that most of the hospitalizations and many of the deaths that we've seen due to COVID-19 are in people with chronic diseases. And rather than the focus being on, we need to do a better job with chronic diseases and preventing respiratory infections in people with chronic diseases, much of the backlash on social media came out of, oh, you're saying these people, it's their fault that they ended up in the hospital because they've got chronic diseases. We need to turn that uh, conversation around to, to the focus is on what can we do to maximize the health of people who've got these chronic diseases to reduce the impact of those diseases. And many of that comes back to the prevention space and to the vaccination space and the healthier communities from the standpoint of eliminating food desert and eliminating a lot of other things that play into that. Well, I wanna thank the, my fellow members of this, uh, this panel. Uh, I want to thank the members of the committee for uh, uh, indulging as we've talked through these things. Uh, we, at this point, are, it's time for us to turn to our next panel. Uh, our next panel is Protecting the World Through Immunization. The COVID-19 pandemic and associated disruptions have strained health systems globally. In this session, we'll review data and solutions to address disruptions, including anti-poverty vaccines for neglected tropical diseases and some digital solutions from the World Health Organization. We'll hear from Dr. Anita Shett at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Peter Hotez from the Texas Medical Center, Baylor College of Medicine and Rice University, and Dr. Garrett Meal from the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Shett, uh, you uh, have the floor. Your slides are up. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. Hopkins and the committee for inviting me here for this discussion. So in my talk today, I am going to discuss how we can address global immunization disruptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And you will notice that I added to my title the terms recovery and resilience, as these are important concepts. We're not there yet, but I would love to generate a discussion on how to achieve these goals. Next slide, please. 
This slide takes a long look at global vaccination coverage over the past four decades. So please look at the black whirly line here. This represents global coverage of DTP3, third dose, um, as shown on the axis on the right side. You can see there's a steady increase from 1980 to 1990 across the world. Um, and after that, it stays as a plateau almost. And the striking thing here is that the coverage was 83% in 2009, then increased to 86% in 2019, and then sadly dropped to 83% in 2020. So we just lost 10 years of progress. And the bars show the proportion of children under vaccinated. These are infants. Um, and the dark blue shows those that are zero dose. So these are children who received no vaccines at all. And the gray represents those that have received partial vaccine doses. So clearly there is an uptick of both categories in 2020, which is really concerning. Next slide. In the analysis that we did with the WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and other partners, we looked at the impact of the pandemic on routine immunizations among 170 countries. So we were able to triangulate three data sources, vaccine doses administered in 2019 and 2020, taken together, and then reports from the WHO regional offices and then the WHO-led pulse survey that we administered in 2020. Next slide, please. This is the WHO slide that shows the status of disruptions of routine immunizations during the early pandemic period, March to April 2020. So the majority of the countries are affected, as you can see. The red countries indicate total disruption, and the orange indicates some degree of disruption. And you can see how widespread it is across the world. Next slide, please. So these are graphs that show the performance of individual vaccines. So we took DTP3 and measles as indicators. And these are from the world's WHO regions in 2020. You can see the graphs are segmented into different categories. The first one is global, and then the six WHO regions, the African region, the region of the Americas, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Southeast Asia, and then the Western Pacific. Um, and on the x-axis, we have the months from January to December 2020 for each region. And on the y-axis is the relative change in vaccine doses administered in 2020 compared to administered in 2019. So you can see there is a precipitous drop in immunization services during the first half of 2020 and some partial recovery of these services and coverage in the last six months of the year. But the recovery has been uneven. Um, and this has been seen in both DTP3 as well as measles. Next slide, please. We also looked at the reported reasons for immunization disruptions, and they are as expected. So there was public fears about disease transmission, travel restrictions and severe lockdowns, health facility closures, and also change of health facility into just COVID care as opposed to other services. There were health worker shortages that were very drastic across many countries either because of well, the health workers were falling sick themselves or they were being pulled into COVID care. And then there were supply chain disruptions. These were just a compilation of these self-reported reasons across the different regions. Next slide. So based on these observations and some of the country responses that we saw till the end of 2020, we came up with a set of urgent actions which have universal relevance for sustaining immunization progress. So first we set focus on catch up vaccination to bring those missed children up to speed and then strengthen health immunization information systems. Ensure resource mobilization, not just from global agencies, but also local sources to offset the additional costs needed for maintaining immunization safely. 
then leverage the COVID vaccine rollout, which has gotten the attention of the world. So using these systems to further strengthen routine immunization platforms. And finally, establish best practices to build health system resilience across the world. Next slide, please. So moving on to 2021, here's another aspect that I wanted to highlight, vaccine campaigns. This is an important strategy, especially for vaccines such as measles and polio, where filling in immunity gaps is critical to reduce transmission. And this is a map which shows the extent of postponement of the vaccine campaigns. Of course, it looked much more drastic in 2020, but here's a map from September of 2021. The dots that you see are the specific vaccine antigens. The yellow dots are measles rubella vaccine, and the red, pink, and blue are the different polio vaccines, OPV and IPV. And the green represents countries that have postponed campaigns in 2020, but were able to partially restore them in 2021. The red and orange countries are those that have not yet been able to restore these programs. So that results in millions of children missing out on these doses, even as late as the end of last year. So this is not a very reassuring picture. Next slide. I'd like to take you quickly through two vaccine preventable diseases that we hope to eradicate. So polio is one of them. This is a map taken from the Global Polio Eradication website that was updated just last week. So there are two countries endemic for polio, Pakistan and Afghanistan, shown in the yellow. Um, but the green and orange dots that you see in many other countries are cases of paralytic polio um, caused by circulating vaccine-derived polio virus. So you can see that we're not there yet. Um, these efforts have to be intensified. Next slide, please. And the second infection that has been on everyone's radar is measles. The figure on the left shows a nice drop in measles cases from 1980 onwards across the world. But in 2017, cases started creeping up. And then we ended having a large outbreak in 2019 across the world and in the United States. And we know that vaccine hesitancy, as you just heard, uh, was a major reason for that. And then 2020 appeared to be relatively quiescent for measles, but there were disruptive outbreaks across five WHO regions. So clearly transmission was ongoing. And then for 2021, if you look at the table on the right, that shows the top 10 countries with measles outbreaks reported in the last two quarters of 2021. So these numbers um, seem relatively low perhaps in, in the larger scheme of things, but they're really the tip of the iceberg. And this is because, uh, next slide please. Measles is highly transmissible. Its reproductive number are not as 12 and 18, it's almost three times or more than COVID-19 as we know it. And the reasons for having such low numbers of measles cases in 2020, so what could they be? These are some speculated reasons, but they're all possibly quite valid. So we know that the COVID-19 mitigation measures had people stay at home, social distancing was observed to a large extent, so that reduced transmission of many other respiratory illnesses as well. Measles would be one of them. And then the potentially immunity from, 20, from the 2018-19 outbreaks could have helped in reducing cases. Um, and then we definitely had suboptimal surveillance and underreporting across the world because the whole surveillance system was also disrupted. And then health seeking behavior was drastically low and health facility availability was also severely limited. So these are all potential reasons um, for seeing low measles cases, but this could really be the calm before the storm. We don't know yet because despite our best efforts, we still have 22 million children who did not receive the first dose of measles through routine immunization. And many more missed MCV through the campaigns. 
the figure on the right actually shows the measles cases in the US per year, as reported in the CDC surveillance website. There was this big outbreak in 2019, as we all know, and then the drop in 2020. And there were only 49 cases reported in 2021. But we really know that measles can come into the United States from anywhere in the world. And these low numbers cannot really mask the risk. And we have to work together to close any immunity gap, both in the US and across the world. Next slide. So here's an update for the looking at the immunization stat service status in 2021. So the WHO ran a series of pulse surveys on essential health services across the world and compiled these responses together. Next slide. So here, here's a comparison of the immunization disruptions in these countries in both the years. So the first three bars represent facility-based immunization, and the latter three represent outreach-based immunization. In, in many ways, outreach immunization is actually critical because they reach more vulnerable populations, those who are more likely to be left out. Unfortunately, outreach immunization has been the one that's even more affected because of the pandemic. The yellow color shows the level of disruption at 5 to 50 percent levels, and then the red represents severe disruptions, so greater than 50 percent. So looking at these bars, it would have been really nice to see a downward trend through all of last year. But instead, there was a bit of a drop in the early quarter of um, the first quarter of 2021. But we saw an increase in, uh, towards the end of 2021. There was a 14 percent increase in the immunizations reported by these countries um, among facility base, and then there was a 7% increase in the disruptions for outreach immunization. So this again is very concerning because this is towards the end of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So overall, the conclusions state um, that you know, more than two years into the pandemic, health systems are still not recovering or transitioning beyond the acute phase of the pandemic. And COVID-19 continues to disrupt essential health services in almost all countries across the world. Next slide, please. And I'd like to spend a few moments, if I may, on a question that may not be obvious to some of us, but maybe a valid question to those who focus on urgent domestic issues. Why do we care about disruptions happening in global and distant regions? And one answer, of course, is fundamental, and it's, some, it's the concept of how closely we're all connected. But there are plenty of good specific reasons, too, uh, with data to back these reasons. So one is that routine immunization provides immunity to the entire community in, in, in a large way. And a classic example is the PCB vaccine, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, that has been shown in many countries to protect the older adult population and the elderly when children, infants and children of the same community are immunized. Right. Second is that, you know, we all know pathogens don't respect boundaries and polio is, uh, is an example of, of an infection we really want to eradicate. Third is that the um, viruses evolve and we all know that and we've experienced that. The measles virus is um, a virus that does not evolve as much and that's uh, why we're lucky enough to have this vaccine that is so effective over many, many decades of usage. But this is theoretically possible that right? measles virus can evolve and escape immunity. And we really need to think about that and do everything we can to prevent any immunity gaps from cropping up because of low vaccination rates across the globe. And then fourth, vaccines is a great strategy for minimizing the development of antimicrobial resistance, which we know now is also one of the leading killers of people. And we have several vaccines 
against bacterial pneumonias, influenza, rotavirus have been shown to reduce the usage of antibiotics. And then finally, another reason is that we have plenty of vaccine preventable infections that have pandemic potential. I've listed dengue and Japanese encephalitis. Uh, both of these are arboviral infections with uh, fairly decent vaccines used in many parts of the world. Um, both of these are transmitted by mosquitoes, the Aedes um, species for dengue and the Culex species for Jap encephalitis. And both these mosquito species exist in the United States. So um, this is, and in many other temperate climate countries as well. So these are good reasons to remember know that um, what's happening globally is very critical to what's happening at home as well. Next slide, please. This is um, talking about intensification of efforts and recovery resilience, great um, output put by the polio eradication group on the strategy to um, envision a polio-free world. We can move on to the next slide. Um, and I just want to leave with a quick word on this um, document as well, the Immunization Agenda 2030. This is a great document that's put together by the WHO and multiple partners, including colleagues from my department at the International Vaccine Access Center, Johns Hopkins. And this document puts forth a very articulate strategy uh, to ensure a world where everyone benefits from vaccines. Uh, to improve health and well-being across the world. So I will stop there. I think I have um, a last slide, but I'd like to end to state that vaccine disruptions are continuing on a global scale, and these disruptions have, the coverage has actually slipped back 10 years to 2009 levels, and we all need to be partners in the recovery process and in building the resilience that many partners have put together. So I'd like to thank you and acknowledge my colleagues at IVAC and WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and USAID that helped fund some of this work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shep. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, our next presenter uh, is Dr. Peter Hotez. Uh, Peter, your slides are up. You have the floor. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be with this uh, distinguished group and, uh, and, and speak to you this afternoon. And it's, I've enjoyed listening to the presentations, although lately I'm probably best known for our work on COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines. The truth is most of, almost all of my scientific career has been devoted to this problem of what we call the neglected tropical diseases. Uh, or the NTDs, and and uh, since I was an MD PhD student in the 1980s, been working on this concept of trying to develop vaccines for these very complicated uh, eukaryotic targets, including uh, parasitic worms. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So these these conditions, which are called the neglected tropical diseases is one that's eventually now getting the word out in terms of their impact on global health. It, it began out of the Millennium Development Goals in, in 2000, when Millennium Development Goal number six was to combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And a group of us realized calling something other diseases was probably not a great thing for advocacy. So we coined this term, the neglected tropical diseases, or NTDs which have the following characteristic. Our original list had 12, and now the World Health Organization uh, has expanded it to 20 tropical infections, which are highly prevalent uh, among the poor, uh, endemic. Um, originally, we conceived as rural areas of low-income countries, but we're seeing quite a lot of urbanization now of these conditions. And I'll show you the list in a minute. It'll become clear when you see the list. These are ancient uh, afflictions that have been described in ancient texts, such as the Bible, the Talmud, the writings of Hippocrates, tend to be chronic and disabling conditions rather than killer diseases. And this is a, a yet another reason of uh, that and the fact that they occur almost exclusively in areas of extreme poverty 
and go sight unseen or what we call forgotten diseases of forgotten people as in the title of my my book there on the right they also more often than not are not killer diseases they're more disabling because they cause chronic growth delays blindness or extreme disfigurement and because they cause disfigurement they're also quite stigmatizing, especially for uh, girls and women. And lastly, their other unifying feature, they not only occur in the setting of poverty, but they actually promote poverty because of their st stigma, their chronic effects on the health of, uh, reproductive health of girls and women, on, on child development and uh, worker productivity, and consequently, developing vaccines for these conditions we call anti-poverty vaccines uh, on that basis. On the next slide is the list of these conditions, and I'm very sad to report today that one of our heroes in neglected tropical disease is Muella Malicella, who um, most recently headed neglected tropical disease of the World Health Organization, uh, just passed away uh, today. It was just announced by the World Health Organization, so I'm going to dedicate uh, this presentation to Muella, who was head of the National Institutes of Health uh, at, in Tanzania, and then took on this role uh, a few years ago. Um, this condition, as enumerated by the Global Burden of Disease Study, uh, shows the list of 20, and it's not so much important you remember the specific numbers that intestinal roundworm ascaris causes 446 million cases, or whipworm 360 million, or hookworm 173 million, or scabies or schistosomiasis. But try to remember that every person who lives in extreme poverty which includes the 750 million people identified by the United Nations as living below the World Bank poverty figure of $1.90 a day, has at least one of these infections, and more often than not, they have multiple. So the same person who has scabies could have lymphatic filariasis, or the same person who has hookworm will also have schistosomiasis. And so people are poly-infected. And about 20 years ago, we shaped this plan uh, that's been supported by USAID and, uh, the U and the UK equivalent, the British Department for International Development, DFID, to support packages of donated medicines from the pharma companies for mass treatment and, until we can ha start developing more definitive vaccines for many of these conditions. Unfortunately, now one of the fallouts of COVID-19 is the UK government has pulled out of their funding for neglected tropical diseases, leaving USAID as uh, one of the few large supporters left for funding mass treatments, and USAID is doing this at around a uh, hundred uh, million dollars uh, a, a year. It may not sound like a much, but because these medicines are donated for free, it's only the cost of delivering the medicines at 50 cents a person per year. So we can treat 200 million people every year on USAID funds, so the fact that the UK pulled out has been a big disappointment. And there's also been some social disruption as a consequence of COVID-19. So uh, having health, community health workers administer the medicines, that's been problematic as well. So we're hoping that we do not see reemergence of some of these conditions because we haven't made any progress, but, but this remains to be seen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what we do at our Center for Vaccine Development, which is co-headed by myself and my science partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Patazzi, is uh, we're based at the Feigen Center, named after Ralph Feigen, I'm sure any of you know it, at Texas Children's Hospital. It's the big research building of Texas Children's Hospital. And we've been making progress on vaccines for parasitic infections, including schistosomiasis, hookworm, Chagas disease, and leishmaniasis. And then we actually adopted a coronavirus program about 10 years ago and began making SARS and MERS vaccines. And that allowed us to develop, a, use a similar low cost COVID-19 vaccine that I'll briefly mention at the end. Uh, next slide. So this is our, our one of our major activity for neglected tropical diseases, targeting simultaneously hookworm and schistosomiasis and a polyvalent vaccine. Both of them are significant cause of anemia, of inflammation, of impaired child growth and development, uh, and, and productivity. And they have a lot of epidemiologic overlap in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the poorest areas of Latin America, including Brazil, which again is one of the reasons why uh, the pharma companies have, have historically not been interested in these diseases. Uh, one, they're complex targets, and secondly, 
they have the problem of uh, not having an obvious financial return. So we're also trying to pioneer this concept of, of doing this without large pharma involvement. Not that we have anything against the large pharma companies, it's just it's been hard to persuade them to really roll the dice with us. Um, one exception has been uh, not Merck and Company, but the German Merck, Merck AGAA, that's been, that also owns uh, Sigma Millipore, and they've helped us with some of the um, uh, in-kind support for manufacturing, which has been really, really helpful for us. Next slide. So let me just tell you briefly about schistosomiasis. Our major target is this subcondition, uh, which not many people know about, but it may be the most common condition of girls and women on the African continent. It's called female genital schistosomiasis. It affects about 40 million girls and women. This is a photo for a, a figure from our, our New England Journal of Medicine article on it. And what happens is the, sp the spine-shaped eggs uh, that you see here get lodged in the cervix, uterus, and lower genital tract, and it causes pain and bleeding and, and social stigma, and it peaks around adolescence. So adolescent girls are our most effective adolescent young adult uh, girls and, and, that, and young adult women. And they're often accused by their, and this has been well reported by, uh, and throughout Africa that they're often uh, accused by community health workers of sexual promiscuity because of the, of the bleeding, uh, the vaginal bleeding that's associated with it when in fact they become infected. Uh, this, not, this is not a sexually transmitted infection at all. It's, it's acquired by standing in water contaminated with the larval saccharial stages and it's a disease of extreme poverty. And you can see it's not rare, 40 million girls and women, and it's now been linked to a two to three-fold increase in acquiring uh, HIV AIDS, probably because of the ulcerative disease in the cervix, uterus, and lower genital tract is providing conduits for HIV uh, virus entry. So we've been, next slide, looking at this concept of how to make a vaccine for this condition, and, and this is now a 20-year project um, that we that I started when when we were at George Washington University with Jeff Bethany and, and Alex Lucas. Alex now runs his own group at James Cook University, taking an immunomics approach, doing uh, schistosome protein microarrays, looking at the surface tegument of, of the parasite, cloning the major surface antigens, and then panning it with serum from uh, putatively resistant uh, individuals in Brazil. And from this next slide, we were able to identify. Um, uh, two promising surface proteins known as TSP1 and TSP2. These are tetraspin surface proteins on the outside of the worm, and which makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about a vaccine target. And on the next slide, the, uh, the, we can actually do RNAi, RNA inhibition, and show we can ablate the biogenesis of the tegument. And the protein makes a very good uh, vaccine in, in laboratory mice. And then we were able to pull together uh, funding in order to make this under uh, good manufacturing practices and then formulate it on alum together with a synthetic lipid A from injury from the Infectious Disease Research Institute, uh, glucopyranosyl lipid A, which gets to be one of our first barriers in vaccine development for these conditions since so many of the adjuvants are proprietary or are owned by the big pharma companies, we have limited access to open source adjuvants, and one of them is this glucopyranosyl lipid A from, from injury, which is a TLR4 uh, agonist. And on the next slide, um, we've now completed a phase one uh, clinical trials, and, and in, this is what I mean by trying to scrape together funds. Tony Fauci was very helpful for us in, um, in, in allowing us to work through the VTEU mechanism uh, uh, which was actually done at Baylor College of Medicine, Bob Atmar and Wendy Keidel to get through the phase one. And now through NIH funding, this is going into phase, this is in phase two trials in, in Uganda and in Brazil. The problem that we face though is not really knowing what the end of the road looks like in the sense that um, the funding required for a pivotal phase three trial is is quite expensive. It's not hundreds of millions, but it could be tens of millions. And also, we still don't have an industrial partner to do the industrial scale production. So we can make the phase one, phase two pilot lots uh, in our lab, and, and we're, the, we're the contract manufacturer. But identifying a pharma company to actually 
scale it up and make it for those pivotal studies, that's another problem. We're hoping some of the breakthroughs that we've had with partnering with COVID-19 vaccines with developing country vaccine manufacturers, now we're going back to them to see if they might have an interest because that was a very successful partnership going back to us to work on a schistosomiasis vaccine. Next slide. The, um, and then for hookworm infection, uh, which is about the same time frame, it's a little bit different. Here we're trying to interfere with the blood feeding apparatus of the worm. So the worm uh, swallows uh, blood and then it breaks it down with a series of enzymes bound to the surface of its uh, gut via Peter to GPI anchor sequence and uses those enzymes to break down the blood cells and feed on hemoglobin. And we can actually immunize with these enzymes and, and block uh, uh, blood uptake and heme detoxification. On the next slide. Um, for this one, we've created a European partnership known as HookVac with the Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and the University of Amsterdam, University of Leiden, University of Tübingen in Germany. And, and now this is uh, completed phase one clinical trials as a bivalent vaccine, again on alum with glucoparanosyl lipid A uh, in, uh, in Gabon. And so again, we're trying now to uh, create a chart a path for getting this into phase three trials. Uh, next slide. And finally, um, Catherine Jones and her group is heading a uh, Chagas disease vaccine, and this is actually supported by the Carlos Slim Foundation um, and moving into clinical trials in New York. And this one is a bit different. It's a therapeutic vaccine that um, is used to halt the progression of fibrosis and inflammation resulting from the presence of parasites in the heart tissue. Uh, and and the problem is the current treatment approach, benzonidazole chemotherapy, can get rid of uh, parasites in the periphery, but doesn't seem to be adequate for uh, the parasites in the heart and the progression of Chagasa cardiomyopathy, which leads to cardiac aneurysms and dysrhythmias. And so by giving this as an immunotherapy, it can uh, actually uh, kind of rescue uh, the, the drug in a, in a, in a vaccine-linked chemotherapy approach. So as you can see, these are not easy targets, um, but, but we are making progress obviously much faster if we had something equivalent to uh, some of the, the COVID vaccine support. And, and the problem is with these conditions, they haven't gone away with COVID-19, they've gotten worse because they've gotten neglected and we're still trying to quantify exactly how. So finishing up, next slide. Um, and now, of course, we've used the same approach for a COVID-19 vaccine. So most of our vaccines are uh, genetically engineered in yeast or bacteria. We make them by microbial fermentation because of the low cost and the experience with them and the fact that um, microbial fermentation in yeast is, is in place um, for re making recombinant hepatitis B vaccine in Argentina, and Brazil, and in India, and Indonesia, and Bangladesh, and Vietnam. So. Um, we use that same approach for our COVID-19 vaccine in order to address this terrible equity gap where the African continent and much of Southeast Asia uh, remains unvaccinated. On uh, the next slide, um, what we did was we've, uh, we licensed our vaccine with no patents, no strings attached to four uh, developing country vaccine manufacturers. They call themselves that, the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network, BioE in India. Uh, Biopharma in Indonesia and SEPTA in Bangladesh and Immunity Bio, which is now building capacity in Botswana and South Africa. And, in, and what we do is we actually transfer ownership. So we, uh, we license it, we provide the production cell bank, we help in the assay development, we help in the co-development. And then f once they produce it on the industrial scale, they own it and they work out the regulatory plan with their national regulators. So with India, it's the DCGI, the Indian Regulatory Authority, and work out the, the, the dissemination of the, of the information uh, about it. And right now, this one has been released for emergency use in India. They've got 250 million doses, and they're moving rapidly towards a billion doses. Uh, this, it's the emergency use is for adults, but now they're moving rapidly towards uh, finishing step-down studies in the kids and also as a booster and now working out with the World Health Organization a, a um, regulatory plan for, for global licensure. And now Indonesia is not far behind and because it's a vegan vaccine, 
uh, produced in yeast. They are actually looking at this as a halal vaccine for Muslim-majority countries, which is very cool, we think. And, and so making progress in the hope that, that we can have a couple of billion doses of this fairly quickly, because there's no limit to the UI you can make. It's the least expensive of the COVID-19 vaccines. This one will be 145 rupees, which I have to look up. It's $1.90 uh, dose, and the CPG may be the most expensive part. It's a recombinant protein on alum with CPG from the Dynavax Corporation, so making progress there. So uh, I think I'll stop, and, and that way we can leave a lot of time for the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Our next presenter is Dr. Garrett Neal, World Health Organization. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thanks. It's a, it's a real honor to be here and speak with you today. Um, I'm going to share a story about developing a new approach to supporting digitalization of country routine health information systems, including immunization. Um, in 2020, WHO member states uh, endorsed a five-year global digital health strategy, which focuses on collective actions to support digital health systems transformation across all countries. It includes four strategic objectives, including the advancement of people-centered digital health systems. Um, the strategy acknowledges the need for digital health approaches that facilitate data exchange using the interoperability standards and the importance of security and privacy of health data, equitable data sharing for research, and the critical need for citizens to have access to their personal health records in digital formats. As part of WHO's contribution to the digital health strategy, I'm going to speak about how we are helping countries adopt uh, computable care guidelines for immunization. Next slide. Countries are investing heavily in digital health systems as a means of optimizing and addressing persistent challenges. Guideline recommendations detailing specific evidence-based clinical and public health interventions and care pathways directly impact the behavior of actors across healthcare delivery. Health system digitization stands to either help or further hinder guideline implementation. With appropriate support, digital health systems can save lives. Next slide. As I think everyone knows, WHO is a technical health agency with a mandate to distill evidence into clinical, public health, and data recommendations that countries then use to define operational approaches for their health workforce. We produce roughly 25 guidelines each year, and it may take many years for countries to adopt these guidelines, if at all. The translation from narrative to digital tools and systems is fraught with challenges in translation and operationalization. Translation is extremely resource intensive for each country, and interoperability standards are often not prioritized, and updates are a hurdle. Few digital systems contain up-to-date recommended WHO algorithms, schedules, and indicators. Next slide. In 2021, in The Lancet, WHO published a framework for how we as an organization will be releasing our clinical, public health, and data recommendations alongside derivative products focused on digitalization and interoperability of routine information systems. We call this approach SMART Guidelines. Next slide. We've adapted the framework from Boxwalla and Maria Michael's work, and SMART Guidelines consist of five knowledge layers to support all stakeholders in the digitization process to facilitate fidelity of digital systems that are consistent with the intent of each guideline recommendation, whether they be schedules for vaccination or uh, cutoff points, et cetera. Next slide. To provide a quick example of the work focused on smart guideline digitalization, I'll use the example of routine immunizations and the guidance for health providers and person records for their patients, personal records for their patients. In this slide detailing the L1 layer, the L1 knowledge layer documentation, you see WSHO guidance and products related to personal health cards. Many of these approaches exist in paper format and guidance detailing the minimum data set, design, and health content that's important for immunization cards and personal uh, home-based records uh, held by the patient 
are detailed in these documents. Next slide. The next slide focuses on the narrative operational guidance for the health worker. What you can see here is a screenshot of the recommendations taken directly from the narrative guideline. They are specifically detailing vaccination schedules for specific age groups and operational programmatic recommendations, some of which may be open to interpretation when brought into a digital system. Next slide. I'll go into the additional SMART guideline layers for establishing digital tools for the health workforce. In the L2 layer, Digital Adaptation Kit, we focus on documentation of requirements for a digital solution to be developed, consistently with expected care pathways, detailing interactions between actors in the health system, including workflow diagrams, data that should be collected, decision points, priority performance monitoring indicators, and the functionality is important for bringing a tool to life that will be valuable for the health worker. Currently, this requirement gathering process can take months, if not years, to conduct at the country level. And in countries where resources are already limited, we want to be able to accelerate this process by providing the 80% generic content to allow for countries to really focus on the 20% adaptation they will likely need to make for their context. Next slide. Here you see screenshots of SMART Guidelines Layer 3, read, uh, machine readable content. The L2 digital adaptation kits are then used to translate into computable and interoperable content the structured logic, the data requirements, and the calculations that we've mapped to the International Classification of Disease and HL7 FIRE standards. We've also used the clinical practice guidelines on FIRE implementation guide and clinical quality language. This code is executable on many standards-based technology platforms. The advantage is the technology partners can then leverage this content for their various digital systems, knowing that the content has been directly vetted by WHO clinical experts. This approach also ensures that countries can execute the machine-readable code on a variety of systems, confident that they're using the latest interoperability standards and they aren't locked into a specific digital product. Next slide. And then we arrive at layer four. Here, the guidelines have been fully incorporated into a point of care software application for health providers, and that can also be then in integrated into the country's digital health system. This screenshot is from an L4 layer, reference software, and as you can see, has fields for data capture while conducting a patient assessment at, or in a facility or at a vaccination campaign. This software is based on the decision logic, data standards, and definitions that were defined in layer two and now are expressed in code in layer three, but adds the digital functionality and user interface necessary so the software is ready to be localized and deployed for use by health program actors in a country. Immunization is not the only healthcare program where smart guidelines are already being developed and digitalized systems being implemented. Smart guidelines are drafted or in progress for 10 other health domains across primary health care. WHO has also partnered with Google to support country capacity building and establishment of an open source technology stack and libraries known as software development kits to facilitate adoption of WHO smart guidelines packages so that technology vendors are able to build mobile applications within a free software library that's built on open and free standards. Next slide. Additionally, because the health worker is using a digital software in the, on the immunization side, we're able to ensure that their patient is then also able to retain their own vaccination card. The electronic vaccination card is a personal health document to support continuity of care and proof of vaccination. Additionally, because the business logic is computable, and as the science and schedules around immunizations evolve, the patient can be alerted to upcoming needs. Additionally, because we've used HL7 FIRE, the International Patient Summary, and the Smart Health Card Standards, these are durable future-proof digital formats. And it means that you and or anyone with a smartphone will be able to retain your own health record digitally. And the foundations are then there to expand and evolve with your immunization record as well as your personal and health system needs. Next slide. Standardized, and could you click it seven times? 
Sorry, I realized um, I should have provided this without any animation. Um, standard, standardized health content with consistent metadata enables reuse of data captured in clinical workflows for secondary purposes and the patient-mediated exchange of personal health records, including decision support and program and adverse advent reporting. Next slide. Individuals who wish to take their personal health record across jurisdictions should have the ability to present their health record and know that another facility or health provider will be able to read them and update them with appropriate additional health information. An interoperable digital health trust network is enabled by consistent metadata, digital health solutions that are conformant to standards and linked through a web of trust. The web of trust is enabled by gateways between jurisdictions, public key infrastructure, and policies and protocols for mutual recognition and privacy protection. This is an approach consistent with what the European Union is using to facilitate trust for personal records within and across borders. Next slide. As WHO, we're aiming to ensure that governments are able to leverage digital solutions that are consistent with our clinical and public health rec recommendations and also with smart guidelines content and specifications, and which are also safe and ready for country use. We're developing an assessment framework and testing platform to facilitate software vendors to prototype and test their solutions for conformance to standards for data exchange within a sandboxing platform. The Digital Clearinghouse will curate products that meet these specifications so that countries can then adopt them uh, and bring them to life in their own countries. Next slide. The benefits of the smart digitalization process and, and specifically for immunization is that it reduces costs and time of software development cycles by reusing common requirements and computable assets. It also makes available digital solutions that are consistent with recommendations and technical spec specifications. It also ensures that there's consistent representation of metadata for mutual recognition or reissuance and interoperability between systems, including the indicators that need to be populated at a, a facility level, at a national level, and at a global level. It also provides patients access to their personal health record for the purposes of continuity of care. Countries can then confidently evolve legacy paper systems into digital connected solutions that are architected for the future using the standards of FHIR and the International Patient Summary. Next slide. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. I'd, I'd like to thank our many collaborators, including CDC and PATH, Hamilton Health Sciences, Google, and ONA, and many donors have contributed to the development of this approach. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Neal. Are there any uh, questions or comments for our presenters in this panel? Steve, John Douglas, get your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, that was a really great panel. I had a question for Dr. Hotez. Um, when you talked about the number of vaccines that could be developed, you were using billions with a B. And I'm just wondering, you know, under optimistic scenarios, how much of existing or future need might be able to met, be met by the approach that you guys are working on? Uh, we're talking about COVID specifically or? Yeah, I'm or sorry. Yeah, co COVID. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, again, you know, we, we can move pretty quickly. I mean, I think one of the problems that we're facing now is um, because there's so much uh, vaccine out there and so many people are infected, it's getting harder and harder to do phase three randomized clinical uh, trials. So, for instance, in India, 85% of the country is already infected. So the DCGI, the Indian regulators, told uh, Biological E um, that um, there, the feasibility of doing a phase three randomized uh, placebo controlled trial is really tough because they'd have to enroll 400,000 people to do a 30,000 person study. And then there's the whole ethics at this point of, of, of a placebo. Um, so uh, they asked them to do a superiority study 
which is to compare it with the AstraZeneca vaccine, and it was in terms of all the immunological parameters, in terms of virus neutralizing antibodies, virus neutralizing antibodies against the variants, uh, you know, length, durability of virus neutralizing antibodies, T cell responses, safety, and that's that was the basis for emergency use release. The problems with the World Health Organization. So far, they've not made a plan for what happens for these next generation vaccines because they're still so far insisting on a phase, you know, phase three that it is a placebo controlled large trial, similar to what was done for Moderna, Pfizer, the others. But there's about four or five now developing country vaccine manufacturers are trying to uh, understand, um, you know, how they're going to do that. And, and it's sort of disappointing that the WHO has had over a year or two years to think about this, and they still are only now beginning to think about it. So this is slowing things up because BioE will soon have a billion doses ready to go, and there's a, a bit of a disconnect because you have the leadership of WHO saying that a, a three billion people have yet to receive their first dose, but there's a billion doses waiting for them and, and others as well. So I'm um, trying to get, trying to figure out that disconnect has been somewhat challenging so far. But, but but they can move quite quickly, and same with Indonesia. Yeah. So Daniel Hoff does his hand up next. Uh, thanks, Bob, um, and uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, for giving their great presentations. My my question is uh, also for Dr. Hotez, um, and not about the COVID vaccine work, but about the NTD work. Um, I certainly applaud all your efforts in those areas, and I'm very impressed with your um, ability to fundraise to get some of these vaccines into the clinic. And I wondered what you thought were the most important reasons for your success in that area. Well, I wake up every morning feeling like I'm a failure because uh, because the problem is, you know, I raise between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 dollars and we need 10 to the 7 10 to the 8 dollars so it's it's not nearly as good i think a lot of it is tenacity and our persistence and and keeping at it and and i think the other most important is been keeping our group together for the last 20 years and keeping our scientists uh and not losing not losing steam i think we've had to learn to diversify from the NIH, the NIH has been great. Um, the Gates Foundation in the past has been great, but you know, no donor stays with you forever. So trying to bring in new donors is it's been the, the most important aspect. And quite honestly, vaccine development is a tough sell for donors because if you think about it, the risk is high. The what the timelines are enormous. Right, you start talking five, ten years, and their eyes glaze over. Um, and and they are tough targets. So that's you know that's I would say does, it takes a special kind of funder or donor to want to go into the vaccine development space. And we're we're lucky we've been able to find some so far. But we always could do a lot better. I mean, I was worried when we were you know put, you know basically ignored by Operation Warp Speed because they wanted speed and innovation and we had an old school vaccine. And even though we weren't gonna be fast on the front end, it takes a little longer to make a pr protein and it does mRNA. You could gain a lot of speed because you have all that vaccine manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries for yeast based for common or protein vaccines, but we could not persuade. Um, Dr. Tony Fauci got us around $400,000 as a bridge fund from our old SARS grant. To, to get us started, but then we really couldn't get large-scale funding from the U.S. government or the G7, so we, you know, had to sort of scrounge for funding from uh, donors from Texas and and uh, and also uh, New York Foundation, the JPP Foundation, it was enough to get us going. And, and now we've done it, but we're still we still struggle for funds all the time. I, I sometimes think my autobiography should be called "Schnoring for Science," uh, trying to. Uh, do just that. Our next question comes from Rob Schechter. Rob, you want to ask your question? Rob, you want to ask your question? Thanks, Bob, and thanks to the panelists for the wonderful presentations. I was wondering for Dr. Shedd or the, or the panel whether um, there's any hints or signals that um, hesitancy to COVID vaccine has contributed along with disruption in 
delivery of primary care to um, so it's spilled over into acceptance into routine vaccines. Is that something we need to worry about? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, um, it, it's, it's a tough question to respond to with any degree of certainty. At present, the reasons that we're seeing for the disruption is primarily shortage of health workers and also the disruptions that happen because of um, the demand side. So the public fear is still lingering for coming out and getting vaccines. So a lot of effort has been made for outreach, and this is in different parts of the world. Vaccine hesitancy is, is definitely there, and um, it could be that there are different populations that contribute to the overall disruptions. There's one aspect, which is vaccine hesitancy. If they don't necessarily mix with the other reasons which cause disruptions. One more reason that we're seeing in many countries is that as they're gearing up for COVID vaccine, because that becomes a target, it really takes away a lot of the health system aspects, um, healthcare workers, facilities, um, it, they're all pulled towards COVID vaccines rather than routine immunization. So that seems to lag behind. So I, I guess these are all the reasons that we're seeing now, but I think these will change over time as well. I'll add to that also that it was, you know, this is Peter, it was Bob Ornstein and Kathy Edwards who taught me that when measles epidemics occurred, they occurred late winter, early spring. So if we'll see if there's going to be a decline in measles vaccinations in the United States, we'll know it presumably by March and April. So kind of holding holding my breath there. And we've been Anecdotally, we're seeing a lot of declines in HPV vaccine uptake in the U.S. Uh, after COVID. I mean, in response to the initial decline from the social disruption, it doesn't seem to be going back up to baseline. But the more we can get a handle on that, I think, could be extremely important. Rebecca Coyle has the next question. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists that uh, I really have enjoyed these uh, presentations. I wanted to focus on more of the digital health component, and I, I just want to say I really appreciate the overview of the smart um, digitalization efforts. And I think one of the areas I think we've particularly struggled with here in the U.S. is that in some locations, the QR code, just because it can generate a QR code, has created a lot of political ire and there are you know jurisdiction states that have laws or policies on the books that prohibit the generation of a smart health card from an immunization information system which is the group that I'm, I'm representing um, and I, I, I guess my question I've got two questions so one um, has WHO encountered this issue or seen this issue with other governments outside of the US and then is um, is it limited to just vaccines or just COVID vaccines, or is this really across the board for any of the smart health cards or um, implementations in other areas of public health? Thank you. Um, th thanks for the question. Um, I think um, the the role of, of a personal record and then its derivative um, products um, represented in a QR code, for example, um, they're uh, being used uh, primarily to either uh, encapsulate data, uh, but also information about um, the origins of who issued the certificate. Um, for example, um, I think um, the uh, many, uh, a lot of the, the work that I think uh, has been done that has uh, where you have agreements between countries or between jurisdictions is where there's a strong foundation in the policy space. So the European Union was able to put together something fairly rapidly uh, on the uh, digital certificates for COVID, uh, primarily because they've been working on uh, on policy on that policy environment for a long time. Um, and um, there was the GDPR, which is the a data protection policy in place that um, where there were um, very important uh, restrictions around uh, data use, data sharing um, that enable that trust between this, the countries to be able to then um, put together an approach that would 
enable trust between countries um, and uh, and only represent the data that was needed to uh, for the pur purposes of proof um, and uh, and so uh, that the what we're seeing um, and I don't know that that answers your question to be honest but um, uh, we do know that there are a number of, of states in the United States who are um, uh, utilizing uh, the smart health card standard um, which is uh, a, a an approach that is uh, digital uh, that allows the representation of your, uh, in this case, a vaccination certificate or a COVID uh, certificate as well, um, that is uh, able to, to be used um, in, in many different um, facilities um, and, and, and be recognized between them. Um, the um, What we're seeing is that within each of these trust networks, um, so the European Union um, or um, the East Africa community, or um, there are groups um, that are being established to uh, ensure that there's trust um, when you take a personal record or a certificate between one trust network and take it to another, that there is um, a recognition of that certificate or that personal health record um, because it's been issued by a trusted authority. And so um, I think one group that is in the United States helping to facilitate uh, that for at least for the uh, COVID certificates is um, uh, the Verifiable Credentials Initiative. Um, and, and that is, I think, uh, working with private sector uh, in the United States across states um, to ensure that there is a, um, an approach that will um, uh, uh, will leverage uh, these standards and, and facilitate use um, outside of the, the U.S. as well because of travel purposes and, and other things. So I don't know if I answered your question. Um, it was a good set of questions, tough ones. Uh, back over to you. Thanks. Thank you. And Lynn Friedland has put a comment in the chat with a reference, you know, again, that Pandemic continues to negatively impact routine immunizations in the United States. Uh, cumulatively, from January 2020 to July 21, teens and adults may have missed an estimated 37 plus million doses of recommended vaccines compared to 2019. And I want to thank uh, our panelists. A very helpful uh, and informative session. I want to thank the members of the committee for their comments. And uh, this time we're going to go to break. Uh, we are on break until uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so uh, break, and we will start promptly at 4 o'clock with Data Digest COVID-19 Vaccine Effectiveness. Uh, thank you for attending our National Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting February 10th, 22. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.